What's up Brozones, welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to a video that I am really excited to make. Also, welcome to my university bedroom. I just want to say before we begin, of course, there are major spoilers for the Fazbear Frights books in this video, and by major, I don't mean just the plot of the epilogue. When you hear the spoiler, it will change everything you know about the Fazbear Frights universe. So please proceed with caution, uh, read the book, listen to my audiobook, and subscribe, because, because this is not going to be a singular video on the topic. <laughs> I'll be making a lot of videos in the near future on this epilogue, because it really changes everything in a lot more ways than you think. Anyway, let's get straight into a quick summary of what this epilogue holds. Firstly, we meet Larson again, and he finds out something strange about 30 years of the pit. There were actually 30 different victims, and their dates matched up perfectly with the 30 different years of blood that they found in the pit. So in other words, if there was a victim in 1987, there was blood in the pit for 1987. There are a few common traits in all of these victims' stories, and the common factor that links all the victims was the presence of Eleanor. Eleanor all the way from the second story in the series makes yet another return in the epilogues. And this time it's a lot bigger than we first thought. I just want to point out a thought that I recently had about this. Yes, there were 30 years. Yes, there were 30 victims. But do you know what else there are 30 of? There's 30 stories. I think it could be possible that if we counted all the victims in all the stories, it could add up to 30. But there are a few problems with that. Firstly, it's more implied that these victims were killed um, a little bit like what we see in To Be Beautiful. Victims that actually witnessed Eleanor uh, in one-to-one -one interactions. But secondly, there are stories that have big anomalies in this. We can't count the victims in Lonely Freddy, He Told Me Everything, or Gumdrop Angel. Why not? It's because it's implied that the fates of these people happened to loads of others. In Lonely Freddy, Alec falls into a dumpster uh, as a Freddy to find there are hundreds of other Freddies like him. In He Told Me Everything, it's implied that all of the children had the same fate as Chris in the lab experiment. And in Gumdrop Angel, I don't think Angel was the only one to become a gumdrop girl and then have little children take their nose and then the cycle continues. So there's stories that I have doubts about and I don't think the 30 victims are the victims from the stories, but it was an interesting thought. We then find out that there was a scientist called Dr. Talbert. Now, later in the story, we also discover he worked hand in hand with Dr. Taggart, who was the scientist that built the Stitch Wraith. Now, I find this very, very interesting. The reason I find it interesting is because Dr. Talbert is known for experimenting with Remnant, which is something we wanted to know uh, a little bit more of uh, in the games. It turns out that like in the games, uh, Remnant is in fact a mercury-like molten metal. Uh, let's ignore FNAF AR for a second. You know, Illumix, Illumix stuff. Just Illumix things. The reason I find this interesting is because we have Dr. Taggart, who worked on Agony, and Dr. Talbert, who worked on Remnant. I think it's safe to say they are two different things. They come hand in hand. Agony is what animates things like the Paper Pals, for example, while Remnant is what keeps William and Michael alive. The other question I have about this, though, is how did Dr. Talbert get his hands on Remnant? That is the big question in my head right now. So then we see Jake, who wants to take Ronelle to her father, and we actually find out that her father is Dr. Talbert. There's something very sus about this, though. On the wall was a picture of Talbert with a young girl with curly black hair, who looked nothing like Ronelle did. It turns out that Dr. Talbert isn't actually Ronelle's father, and that she was creating this illusion with the heart-shaped pendant. A heart-shaped pendant that belongs to none other than Eleanor, which is Ronelle pronounced backwards. This girl is, in fact, Eleanor, but there's a lot more to it than that. Larson then arrives and sees the girl transform into Dr. Talbert's daughter, 
And it's here where the story starts to go a little bit haywire. We find out that Eleanor was actually responsible for making the plush trap chaser in Out of Stock. We literally see her adding the human features to the face. Then Larson gets pulled into a kitchen area. He looked at the digital clock. And at this point, my head just went completely insane. I could not believe what I was reading here. The clock said 1.35 a.m. and he starts to hear tapping outside and something inside attacking him. He even sees Delilah from that story in bed panicking because she could hear the Ella doll attacking her. It's good to point out that Delilah couldn't see or hear Larson, so all of this is just an illusion. The scene then changes to a surgical table where Pete from Step Closer dies. Lies, dies, yeah. Pete slowly deforms into the man in room 1280 where we hear Eleanor in the dark. The scene then goes to a maze game um, with a whole scene in the background with a fire station and a school, etc. And this is where Eleanor starts to run away, only for Larson to chase after her and see Toby from Hide and Seek smiling as he is impaled to the wall. Larson runs after Eleanor uh, and comes to a train track where he sees two figures, one of them with a big bird suit, getting run over by the train. <laughs> Clearly this is Sam from Blackbird, uh, and Eleanor had a part in tormenting Noel with the suit. So I believe this to be the big reveal that Eleanor is the mastermind behind every Fazbear Fright story. In some way, Eleanor corrupted every story that changed the outcome and gave her more victims. How she did this is going to be a whole separate video. But one story out of this that seemed very important to me was The Man in Room 1280 because it's weird how Eleanor was there. How was she there? Again, subscribe because we're going to be going over that very, very soon. The final few things to point out here is the big question that I had while I was reading. What exactly is Eleanor's motivation? And that question gets answered quite quickly actually. We see Jake attacking Eleanor only for Dr. Talbot to fire his gun right at his battery. So what's Dr. Talbot's motivation? Well, clearly he thinks Eleanor is his daughter. He just wants to protect her. Eleanor isn't actually his daughter, she's just making him think that. And by having him on her side, she gets access to two things. The first thing, as we literally just mentioned, is protection. But the second thing, and the big thing that Dr. Talbot has, that Eleanor wants, is Remnant. We actually see Talbot hold some Remnant and say that he will make a better Eleanor with it. And here is where Eleanor's motivation is. Remnant is described by three words in this story. Power, life, eternal. Remnant is what gives Eleanor power. Remnant is what gives her life. And it's also what makes her immortal. Eleanor is tricking Talbot into giving her remnant and it's making her more powerful and harder to beat. The only thing I can think that can be done is to break the pendant. Break the necklace and there's no more illusion. Talbot will find out the truth and when he does, he'll make sure Eleanor knows about it. Also, there could be a fire. <laughs> anyway, Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, this is a really interesting epilogue as it opens a whole new can of worms for the series and it puts things in, in into more perspective. I'll be making some more videos on this very soon so make sure to subscribe for that. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you later. Goodbye.